Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on gaining insight from the world's best macro minds. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. We are here with you today to provide a debrief of the FOMC November meeting. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews that will help keep your portfolio on track. Today, we are here with Joseph Wang of FedGuy.com to discuss the Fed's path forward. Joseph, welcome to public. Hey, Kyle. It's great to see you again. Great to be back. Yeah. It's always really fun talking about the Fed with you. But I feel like this time around, we don't have that much to discuss. Uh, the Fed pretty much did what everybody was expecting. So yesterday, the Fed decided to skip another rate hike. Um, what do you think the Fed's reasoning was for that? Yeah. So I think before we jump into that, we should level set a little bit so that we know just how just how we got to where we are. So the last time we had a Fed meeting was in September. And September is one of those special meetings where we get a dot plot. Now, at that dot plot, the Fed guided towards one more rate hike this year. But between then and now, we've had some pretty interesting things happen in the markets. We've seen the 10-year yield rocket to over 5%. It's retreated back, but then, you know, it it did go up a lot. And during the intermediate period, we also had a few Fed officials, uh, including President Mary Mary Daly, which I know you know well, begin to think that, you know, longer dated yields have gone up a lot. To some extent, that's tightening financial conditions, and maybe that can substitute for further rate hikes. So heading into this meeting, what everyone was thinking was, how does Jay Powell think about this rise in longer dated yields? Now, as you note, no one was expecting any action today in the November of in the November meeting, but heading into this meeting, there was still some people pricing in uh, some probability of a rate hike in December or early next year. Now, what I thought was really interesting about this meeting was that um, coming out of it, we got a better sense as to how Jay Powell and the FOMC are thinking about the rise in longer dated yields. It seems yeah. like what they're saying is, yes, it is possible that that could substitute for some degree of tightening, but he actually gave us a framework. So he gave us two principles. One is that it has to stay stay up there. You can't just you know go to five percent and go right back down to four percent. That that's not real tightening of financial conditions. So that's one leg. The second is that it has to be because of term premium. That is to say, it has to be going up, and not because the market thinks the Fed is going to hike. And so far, what I what what I'm seeing in the market is that, of course, the second principle, term premium, is met. The first one, though, it looks like it's probably met. You know, so again. Yields have come down since their highs, but they're still comfortably above where they were in September. So I think the market is looking at this and thinking that, you know, it's probably less likely for the Fed uh, to hike going forward. Can you define what term premium means? I know Lori Logan had mentioned that, the Dallas Fed president, um, and it's something that's pretty abstract. So what would be a way that you would define it so people can understand better? Yes, of course. So I think traditional economists look at, let's say, a 10-year yield and decompose it into two components. The first is that the expected path of Fed policy. So let's say the 10-year yield is at 5%. Well, part of that could be because the market expects the path of interest rates to be, you know, uh, around 4% on average going for the next 10 years. It's just an expectation what the Fed will do. But of course, if you're asking someone to go out and lend money at the tenure, tenure well, there, there's some risk there. So in order to entice market participants to uh, lend there, you have to give them some extra compensation. That's term premium. And so in my example, you know, if you have a 5% yield and the expectation from the market is you know, going forward 4% path of policy, then that would be a 1% term premium. Now, the way, that, to be perfectly clear, though, the way that people tease this out is through models. And every model will give you a different answer. So in some sense, uh, it's, it's a very subjective idea, but the Fed believes in it. So we got to, uh, we who watch the Fed got to put some credits in it. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, with the economy right now, because it seemed like inflation was slowing down, seemed like the labor market was slowing down. um, But there were some prints where we added more jobs than expected. CPI came in a little bit hotter than people wanted in September. So how is the Fed looking at all of this macro data? Like, obviously, they've decided to pause, so they're not that concerned. But do you think post-December that they could hike again, considering what we're still seeing 
in the macro. So Chirpal was very clear that he's keeping open the possibility of hiking further. Like the data that you cited is is something that, that you have to keep watch on. But I think if you take a step back, let's say looking at the past two years, inflation has definitely trended lower. So they're happy with that progress is being made. But I think Chair Powell describes progress as lumpy. So he's, he acknowledges that sometimes, you know, inflation is going to take up, but the trend he perceives to be downward. So he spent a lot, a lot of time in the press conference reiterating that he believes that interest rates are restrictive. What he's trying to figure out is if it's sufficiently restrictive. So he's trying to figure out if he's going to hike one more time or more or not. Um, he uh, was very noncommittal and they could have depended on it, which, which is totally reasonable. I think we should also step just one year, so just rewind a little bit to see what happened, uh, let's say, last year at Jackson Hole. Like at Jackson Hole, Chair Powell gave his very memorable speech that, you know, he's going to hike rates and there will be some pain. His mental motto, of course, was that he would hike rates, there would be a recession, unemployment will go up, wages would go down, and then inflation would come down as well. That was the traditional economist mental model. And true to his word, he hiked rates significantly. Uh, but I think to the surprise of many people, um, GDP didn't go down. Economic growth accelerated. As we know, they had a bonkers print last quarter. Inflation came down and unemployment stayed low. So I think there's a bit more humility into um, their mental models that maybe the world doesn't work that the way they thought. And so I think that makes them extra data dependent and cautious. Yeah. And um, I think, too, going back to the point about, you know, fiscal and um, what bond yields have been doing, uh, it seemed like this week it was almost a bigger deal around the Treasury refunding announcement versus the Fed meeting. So could you talk about the fiscal side? And Jerome Powell said the fiscal path seemed unsustainable. So could you talk about the Treasury funding and how that ties into what the Fed is looking at as well? Absolutely. Uh, honestly, for, for me, the biggest event on that day was the quarterly refunding announcement. That was much more interesting to me. And I can't remember a time when that was ever the case. So right. it may be a sign of the times. Now, if you look back to what happened the past year, Fed hike rates aggressively thinking that there would be a recession and there wasn't. Again, as we discussed, GDP accelerated. I think a big part of that is because fiscal spending was very strong. I believe the deficit was about 7%. So on the one hand, you have the Fed raising rates, trying to slow the economy down. On the other hand, you have Congress pouring gasoline on the fire. So they're very much working in opposite directions. And I think that so far, it seems like the, um, the fiscal side is winning. Mm -hmm. Now, this actually has very clear implications, not just for macro, but for interest rates. So as we discussed earlier, one of the biggest things that happened since the last Fed meeting was that the 10-year Treasury yield and other longer-dated yields rose significantly. Um, one of the primary reasons that rates rose so much was because of the deficit. So when, the con when Congress uh, spends more than it takes in in taxes, it has to make up the difference by issuing debt. So basic supply and demand, when you issue a lot of debt, well, supply of debt increases, the price of debt declines, which is another way to say that yields go up. So a big part, a big reason driving the rapid rise in longer dated yields is because of the deficit. And um, so the Congress funds the deficit, oh, sorry, the US Treasury funds the deficit, but it has discretion as to where along the interest rate curve it issues. So for example, the Treasury could issue a lot of short dated Treasury bills, which the market could absorb very rapidly, or it could weigh issuance towards the longer end of the curve where there's less liquidity and will put more upward pressure on interest rates. Now, let's rewind back to just last quarter at the August quarterly refunding. At that time, the U.S. Treasury surprised the market by uh, declaring larger than expected uh, coupon issue sizes. So they were going to issue more than expected longer dated debt. And that seems to give the market a bit of indigestion and really pushed yields higher. So this time around, when at the next quarterly refunding announcement, the market was very focused as to whether or not the Treasury would continue to rise up their uh, coupon issuance. The Treasury surprised the market a bit by both announcing that they would uh, not increase coupons as much as they expected and that maybe they only have one more 
um, increase in coupon sizes next quarter. But also, in my view, more importantly, they announced a policy change. Well, they strongly hinted at a policy change where going forward, they would structurally issue more treasury bills, which are more easily absorbed by the markets. And that announcement, I think, uh, put tremendous downward pressure all along the interest rate curve and was the big news of the day, uh, very much eclipsing the Fed. And maybe that's a sign of things to come. Because mm -hmm. I do think that was freaking the, the bond market out quite a bit was the worries about the deficit and whether or not that be sustainable because of how fast the Fed has hiked rates, because that makes you know the debt that much more difficult to finance. And so it seems like Yesterday, we got quite a bit of good news. Like, we got good news from the refunding announcement. We got relatively good news from the Fed. Um, and looking forward, do you think that into 2024, the Fed could cut? Jamie Dimon came out this morning of JP Morgan and said that there could be 75 basis points more of hiking. So, do you see us going more on the cut path or more on the hike path or just sort of staying where we are? So I'm in the other camp. I think it's more likely that we cut next year, maybe as soon as March. And I'll tell you why. So first, I think when it comes to um, interest rates and the economy, the economy is much more impacted by longer dated interest rates. So the Fed over the past year has raised the overnight interest rate significantly. But, you know, nobody borrows at the overnight tenor. So that doesn't really do anything. Um, but a rise in the 10-year yield, though, that directly impacts mortgages, that directly impacts a lot of corporate borrowing, that's going to meaningfully tighten financial conditions. So um, I think that's going to meaningfully slow the economy uh, going forward. So I think inflation is going to come down probably faster than expected. Now, the second thing is my sense is, is that the Fed has actually been setting up for a bit of a adjustment next year. So the way that the Fed looks at the world is that they look at the world through the lens of real interest rates. So real interest rates are nominal minus inflation. Now, as inflation gradually comes down, real rates are going to rise. Now, I don't think the Fed wants that. I think they want to uh, keep the level of real rates uh, constant. So they don't want to be um, tightening monetary policy even as the economy is slowing down. That wouldn't make any sense. So it would make a lot of sense. So next year, as inflation trends lower, to cut nominal rates a bit to make sure real rates uh, stay where they are. Now, the last thing is that looking across the world, it's very clear that uh, other countries are slowing significantly. If you look at the UK, if you look at the um, Eurozone, if you look at China. So monetary policy is, is more effective abroad, in part because they have a lot of variable rate debt, including their household mortgages. So. Monetary policy is cooling the global economies uh, pretty significantly, and that's going to put downward pressure on commodity prices. And to the extent that we have companies that depend on exports, that's going to slow them down as well. So I think we very much have some tightening coming down the pipeline. So um, to me, I think that we could think about rate cuts maybe in the first quarter of next year. Yeah, because it's one of those things. I think it was Kelly Cox who said that the Fed didn't hike yesterday, but the bond market did. And so, you know, the Fed has these limited tools in their toolkit, but market conditions, as you're talking about, can do a lot of work for them. Do you see them increasingly just relying on that in the future? It sounds like you do. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Honestly, raising and lowering the overnight interest rate, which is what the Fed does, uh, you know, in theory, maybe you can say that, uh, you know, now that I can get 5% on my money market fund, I won't go and spend as much money. Uh, you know, I've honestly never heard anyone say like, you know, money market funds are 5%. I'm not going to go see Taylor Swift anymore. That, I, no one will ever say that, right? Um, in fact, it, when you look at equity prices, people aren't even taking, okay, not a lot of people are taking money out of equities to put in on the money market funds because equity prices still are quite buoyant. Um, so it doesn't seem to have a big impact, but longer dated yields, I think that has a big impact, especially on the real economy. Yeah. And it seems like the Fed is coming around to this idea that the labor market doesn't have to be decimated in order to, to reduce inflation. Um, so do you think that means that a recession could be taken out of the equation? Jerome Powell said it wasn't in their forecast yesterday, but what are your thoughts around that? Uh, I, Kyle, I think you hit the hammer on, on the head of the nail with that comment. I think that's part of the reason why that the market interpreted yesterday's press conference to be dovish. 
So over the past two years, Chair Powell, again, using his mental motto, we got to cause a recession, get unemployment up to moderate wage gains so that um, inflation will come down. And in the past, he has, citing, he has cited with approval work by former Chair Bernanke on the subject that also suggests that you got to have wages come down in order to slow inflation. In fact, I think the FOMC also invented this new super core measure of inflation, which is basically services X housing to, to make that point. Now, the funny thing was that you hiked rates a lot um, and you didn't have a rise in unemployment, but inflation came down and wages moderated. So the, the key there is that wages can moderate through a rise in unemployment, yes, but there's another way, that is an increased supply in labor. So Chair Powell noted that labor participation has been increasing, immigration has been rising. So those two factors have allowed wage growth to moderate without causing a recession, without causing a rise in unemployment. So he still thinks that he believes that he needs a softening of the labor market, but he sounded to me a bit more open-minded on the prospect that that's maybe not absolutely necessary. Yeah, which is probably good news. Um, and then also he made it pretty clear yesterday that they were going to continue with um, the balance sheet tightening, that that was just something that they were going to continue on that path on. Um, what are your thoughts around that and how that'll impact the economy so and the, markets? Yeah. so. That's um, going to be difficult for the Treasury market to digest, I think. So going forward, the Treasury, as, as we discussed earlier, gave the market a bit of a break by declaring that they're going to issue more Treasury bills rather than longer dated Treasuries going forward. But at the end of the day, as Chair Powell noted, the, the fiscal situation is not sustainable. We're issuing tremendous amounts of debt. Uh, going forward, the ex expectation is about $1.5 to $2 trillion every year forever. Now, ultimately, you're going to have to find people who are willing to buy that. And you will, but it might be at very high prices. We could have this runaway, uh, upward runaway trend in yields just come back a few months later. And that is my base case expectation. So ultimately, I think there is really only one solution, and that is the Fed has to come back in and support the Treasury market. And that would mean mm -hmm. an end to quantitative tightening. Um, so right now, I think that's something that will happen sometime probably next year. The Fed, of course, uh, the Treasury gave them a break and they can put on a brave face and say that I'm going to keep quantitative tightening as it is. But I think if we have some disorder in the markets, in the Treasury markets, uh, they'll come back to the rescue. Okay. So do you, so this will be my final question. Um, but do you see us returning to, to ZERP land, like zero interest rate policy land in 2024? Do you think that that's farther out if we ever get back. I that. think that's gone forever. Okay. So it's a kind of amazing that we were ever in that situation. <laughs> so I think what the policymakers discovered in 2020 is that big fiscal works. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in 2008, we had all these people who were deficit hawks who were talking about, you know, we don't want to do all this stuff. And so we had uh, a recession for, for quite some time known as the Great Recession. In 2020, they realized that, gosh, I can print a lot of money and you know, it makes the stock market go up. It makes everyone feel rich. It makes unemployment low. I really like that. So now that the policymakers have realized this, now that the public has realized this, uh, they're going to employ those tools every time we have a downturn. Of course, there's a side effect to those tools. And as we live through the past two years, it's inflation. And mm -hmm. since the tools are going to be used and since inflation is the known side effect, I would expect inflation to be uh, actually high for the coming decade. And so uh, that would mean that interest rates would stay higher than expected. Going back to zero, I don't think is an option. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so the base case that you have is the Fed will reenter the market. Um, rates will be cut a certain amount of basis points. So we sort of, it's not necessarily higher for longer. Oh, it's, it's so... It's maintaining real rates. So I'm not saying that we cut from, I said, we're at, you know, cut to the, I'm not saying we cut to zero. Maybe well, we cut 50 basis points just because inflation is lower, got to maintain real rates. But no, not, not huge cuts gotcha. and adjustment. Okay. And I do believe next year the Fed will have to re enter the Treasury market, uh, if not to stop QT, at, at least to support the markets because uh, the amount of issuance 
going forward is not sustainable and cannot be digested by the market without the Fed's help. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. This was a great conversation. Where can people find all your work? Well, thanks so much for having me. If you're interested in following me, check out my website, fedguy.com. And I have a YouTube channel as well called Joseph Wayne.